Okay, let's begin. So, um, uh, great. So we are in October now. So let's uh, first things first. I wanted to make sure you have this announcement. Uh, number the assignment number three has been posted. Uh, it's due October seventeenth. So this is something you can do. Uh, you have uh, two weeks or so, and uh, you know take your time over the fall break when if you have a chance. Uh, and you have a couple of free day as well. So the the goal here is again, as a team, please submit a short report that describes a model of your system. Uh, all that means is figure out a way to essentially an analyze whatever your innovation is. And this uh, in general, you know, that's referred to as a model. It can be analytical uh, or it can be numerical, like using ray tracing or something like that. Um, so, you know, your particular situation could be different based on the project. Um, but the idea is that you should try to make it as comprehensive as possible. In other words, it should include as many aspects of the system as possible. Uh, not only optical, which is obvious, should be there, um, but also electronic, mechanical, thermal, uh, and design considerations. Um, you don't need to worry so much about the cost uh, right now, but I will ask you as a separate assignment, but all I would say all the technical and um, even aesthetic requirements, I would say less important, but technical most importantly. Uh, and the idea is to develop a comprehensive model that you can then use to analyze the performance of innovation, which will again be one of your future assignments. Um, and uh, in your first report, of course, add some preliminary numbers to explain that your model works. So not just the model, but just an example of, let's say, you know, throw in some numbers and say, okay, this is what you get, you know, for, for instance. Um, okay, so uh, just uh, also as a quick announcement, um, Subhashish, will you have access to email when you are traveling? Uh, uh, while traveling, and when you are uh, not in you, when you are in India, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I'll be. I'll have okay. access. So, yeah. in any case, just as a quick announcement, the TA has to travel on an urgent matter, uh, so he won't be around for the next two weeks or so. But so, feel free to email me directly if you have any questions uh, specifically about the exams or anything. Um, Okay, so we are here, just a quick review on the schedule. We are here, we're gonna talk about anti-reflection coatings. The, I posted a few links here that you can, uh, we'll talk about. Um, this Thursday, we will have a midterm review. Uh, the TA won't be here, but I actually got Aprathim to, who gave you the lecture on geometrical optics to give you the review. So uh, the review will be in class, so make sure you come. Um, the next week is fall break. After that, the next Tuesday, we don't have class. So use that to prepare for your midterm. And this is when your assignment two is, uh, assignment three is due as well. So keep that in mind. And uh, the following Thursday, October 19th, is where the midterm is and it's in class. So you have to come to class to take the exam and it will be during the exact same time as the class. So that's the duration of the exam. Uh, it will be proctored by Aprathim. So the TA won't be here. And then we'll uh, proceed after that, okay? Okay, uh, are there any questions about all that? No? Okay, good. If you have any questions, of course, just email me and I'll get back to you. So today, uh, our goal is to understand a somewhat different application of optics, which is important, but we haven't really touched on so far which can be called anti-reflection coatings. So all optics in general have various kinds of coatings and anti-reflection coatings are probably the most important and most ubiquitous coating that's used. We will refer to these as ARCs, okay, A-R-C. So that's a very common acronym used for anti-reflection coatings. Let's first see what they are, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of us who, most of us who wear glasses are probably familiar with this. So what is anti-reflection? So in this particular picture here, the one eye has the anti-reflection coating, which is of course this side, and the other eye does not. So here you don't see the reflection of uh, what 
this lady is looking at. So you can see there's a reflection of something here. There's no reflection here. And that's because it's an anti-reflection coating which is placed on this piece of glass. So anti-reflection coating uh, essentially means, as the term says, that you suppress reflection from a surface. So, okay, so here you see the reflection, here you don't see the reflection. And there are many more examples here that you can envision. So here uh, you can see some reflections. Here you don't see the reflection. Uh, kind of same thing here, you kind of get fo foggy here. This little, part of this is a little bit of humidity, but there's no reflection. Here there's glare reduction, so anti-reflection coatings can also act as glare reducing. See the difference? And these are glasses, again, you can see the difference clearly, okay? So it's very, it's very, very important clearly and very ubiquitous, right? Any glass through which humans have to see or cameras have to see have to generally have anti-reflection coatings, which means that it is almost in every piece of glass, including, for instance, your phone screens and so on, right? Okay. So what does it mean? What, is a, what are we trying to solve? So imagine you, this is your device, which can be a solar cell or an image sensor if you're a camera. And then let's say this is a protective glass covering. So all solar cells of, of course have some kind of a glass covering. Okay. If you don't have any interreflection coating as shown on the left-hand side here, and light comes in 100%, some of the light gets reflected as we saw in the last lecture. Okay. And some of the remaining portion of the light transmits into the device. If you, don't, if you do use anti-reflection coating, the goal of the anti-reflection coating is to minimize this reflection. Okay? So you can couple most, more of the light into whatever device you're trying to couple this into. If it's a solar cell, of course, it's very important, right? You wanna make sure everything goes in, very little is lost on the top, because that's a very silly way to lose energy. In general, if you don't do anything, on an average, about four to 5% of the light is lost in the case of glass. It depends on the refractive index, clearly, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so let's think about, so now that we know what anti-reflection coding is, let's try to understand the simplest way to design an anti-reflection coding. This is referred to as a quarter wave coding. And quarter wave refers to the fact that you have one fourth of the wavelength of light. Okay, and you will see what this means uh, very quick, very quickly. Um, but before we um, go into this, we need to understand some basic ideas of interference. So there's a little video here, which uh, goes through interference. So let's take a quick look at it. I'm gonna play this and walk you through it as well. Okay. So of course, interference is something you've probably all seen in your high school physics or undergraduate physics. Uh, this is just a review. So the idea is that if you have two waves uh, that are essentially coming from a same coherent source, they can interfere not only, they can not only add in intensity, but they can also interfere, which means adding in phase. Uh, as you probably remember, all light waves can, can are represented as complex numbers, which have phase. So when you have interference, that means these complex numbers are adding with, while retaining their imaginary parts, okay? And you will see what I mean. So let's take a quick look at this. Video animation, we will be able to see constructive, in this video animation, we will be able to see constructive and destructive interference. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen that we have two waves wave one and wave two. Each of these waves has the same amplitude of 50 units here are irrelevant. And the picture above here shows us what the two waves look like when they're added together. And so let's see what happens when we change the relationship between these waves. If I move the waves so that they are in phase, the amplitude of the wave, the resultant wave, increases. So now they are, the amplitude is very large. If I come down and I start to move them so that they are out of phase, we can watch the top of the uh, graph and we can see that the resultant of these two waves when they're added together starts to change. And so it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, 
when they are exactly out of phase with one another, the resultant is that we get destructive interference and we have a resultant wave of zero. So when they are out of phase by 180 degrees, we get a resultant of destructive interference with zero amplitude. And if we move it back up to where they're in phase, the resultant is that we get constructive interference and we get the maximum amplitude. Okay, so you, you get the idea. So uh, what we are trying to do, of course, is that we want to minimize the reflection, which means that we want to ensure that light that reflects from the top, let's say it's represented by this blue curve here, interferes destructively with the light that reflects from the bottom surface, which let's say is represented by this green curve. And if that happens, then we can ensure that when you add them up, as a total, no light will be reflected. As you remember, when these were completely out of phase, this was completely flat. So that's a basic idea of, of the simplest form of an anti-reflection coding, okay? Now, let's take a quick look at how this could be implemented, okay? It's a very, very, very simple example, and I want you to try to do it. So let's say this N represents the refractive index of our solar cell, that's a silicon, okay? This N prime, is a glass which is placed right on top of the silicon to, to protect it, okay? So that's the refractive index of glass, which is N prime, which is different than N. So, no, usually the refractive index of glass is a little bit less than that of silicon. And this is one, this is the refractive index of air, so this is air. Now light comes in from the top, and we're, let's say imagine a sunlight coming in from the top, directly normally incident. Some of the light reflects off the top. Okay, that's what we're trying to minimize. Okay, let's call that A. Some of the light actually goes through, bounces off this interface here, which it can also reflect, right? Because this is glass, this is silicon, and then passes straight out. Okay, let's call that B. Our goal here is, the only thing we can change is the thickness of this glass layer. Let's call it D, okay? What thickness of the glass layer should we choose such that there is destructive interference between the rays A and B, such that nothing, nothing comes up. So if you're able to destructively interfere A and B, that means there will be no total reflection from this interface at the top. Okay, so I want you to think about this for let's say about 30 seconds or so. What, how would you ensure that, what is the thickness of T, this thickness here, says that ray A and ray B interfere destructively. Think about the previous video as a reference. And, and you're welcome to discuss, obviously. Uh, also keep in mind that this topic is included in the midterm, so I can easily ask you simple questions like this. Okay, so I, I think many of you understand how to uh, think about this. So let's uh, try to under see how it works. So the, what you want to do, of course, is you want to ensure that the ray that comes out here and the ray that comes out here are out of phase, right? Remember the video we just saw that these two rays have to be completely 180 degrees out of phase in order to uh, destructively interfere, which means that they need to be different by half a wavelength of light, right? So if you recall this, uh, I won't actually play it, so let's... Um, Okay, so I, I won't play it, but you remember that if this is one form, if this is shifted by half a wavelength, they will interfere destructively. So what you want to do is you want to ensure that the ray, when it passes from here to here to here, it goes through an odd number of half wavelengths. <clears throat> right? So if it pass, if it goes through an odd number of half wavelengths when, and, and it comes out, the, compared to this, it would have shifted by half wavelength. Okay. Now, of course, you have to be careful 
how you do this because the refractive index matters, right? Your optical path length is D times N prime, right? You have to multiply by the optical path length because this is air. So everything is relative to this, which is air. So you need to multiply by the refractive index. So it's D times N prime going down and D times N prime going up. So it's two times D times N prime. And that should be equal to an odd multiple of the half the wavelength of light. Okay, that's the idea. So the idea is the way you solve it, rays A and B are out of phase by pi or lambda over two and it's actually interferes. So the, the way you solve this problem is you take two times D times N prime should be equal to lambda over two or some odd multiple of lambda over two and that will allow you to compute what D is. Now, in order for, and that's a very simple way to think about it. Now, in order for this to work, of course, we've made some very, very simple, simplistic assumptions. First of all, we have assumed that the refractive, um, the, first of all, we assume that this is one wavelength, right? We're not saying what happens at different wavelengths because different wavelengths cannot interfere. You have to be careful with that. The second thing we have assumed that we've only assumed normal incidence. We haven't looked at oblique incidence. We'll talk about that. Um, and we have finally also assume that uh, these uh, rays are coherent. In other words, they can interfere. Uh, if they are incoherent, as might be the case in some situations, then they may not interfere. So these are things we have to think about as well. And we'll we will in this lecture. So let's look at some numbers based on this idea. So this is plotting the reflection of a surface as a function of wavelength here. As I said, it, the wavelength is important. If you take a bare silicon wafer, this is what you see. In fact, if you look at a polished silicon wafer, it actually looks like a mirror. So it actually reflects quite a significant amount of energy. So this shows that you know most of the light, over 30%, this is a reflectivation of 30%, is actually reflected. Okay, this is a function of wavelength. Of course, as you get a shorter wavelength, it gets uh, more of it's reflected. So. It looks like a mirror because you see, you know, something like this is our visible wavelength. You see certainly over 30 to 50 percent of the lights reflected. <coughs> now, if you put glass on top of silicon, which is typically what you do for a solar cell, you are able to reduce this reflection a little bit, uh, quite significantly actually, and we will see why that is. And the main reason for this is because the refractive index of silicon is actually very high compared to that of air. So the Fresnel reflections tend to turn out to be pretty high, and we'll talk about that. Glass, uh, of course, has a refractive index that's between silicon and air that allows it to actually act somewhat as an anti-reflection coating, even without doing anything, just, just putting a piece of glass on. So that's why you get this reduction. Now, of course, if you are very careful and you're able to actually design a nice anti-reflection coating as we just did in the last slide, you can get this curve where you can actually get the refractive reflection to be zero in this particular case and one particular wavelength. So if you only use one layer, you can get it to be zero at one wavelength. Okay, this is silicon under glass with an optimal anti-reflection coating with an N of 2.3. Okay, that's a refractive index at 0.6. Of course, the other wavelengths, you get non-zero reflection and that gives you the challenge of how do you minimize reflection across a broad wavelength range. For a single wavelength is possible, but across a broad wavelength range, it becomes challenging. We'll talk about that also briefly. Now, uh, as I said earlier, the angle of incidence is also quite important. So in general, this is, let's say we have a situation like this. We have, uh, this is glass, and there is, let's say, silicon underneath, which is not shown. And then we have a vapor deposited coating. Okay, that's our anti-reflection coating on top of the glass. If light comes in at a small angle of incidence, as shown here, a small amount of light is reflected. Okay, and the rest is refracted in and then refracted in. Of course, there's a little bit of reflection here as well, right? What this is showing is that if you come in at an even larger angle, so if you have oblique incidence, a larger fraction of the light is reflected. And, and the rest is, of course, refracted and so on. So in other words, the amount of light that is reflected from an interface depends upon the angle of incidence. And you can plot reflectance as a function of angle of incidence and it goes up. So the larger the angle of incidence, larger the reflection. So this is problematic, right? Why? This is problematic because if you think about um, 
solar panels, right? Let's say they're not tracking the sun as in most solar panels on top of uh, houses and so on. Uh, if the sun, when the sun rises, you, you are incident at a very, very large angle, right? Typically, that means that you're losing quite a significant amount of energy just off the top. It's not even reaching the solar cell, which is one very important reason why you don't produce a lot of energy in the, when the sun is not high in the sky. Okay, there are ways to minimize this, which is what we will talk about in this class and also in um, the lecture and light traffic as well. Okay, so now let's do one more uh, practice example. And I want you to now try to do this, take a piece of paper and try to do this yourself. That's relatively simple. So, and it's a very practical problem, okay? So let's say we have a silicon solar cell. It's usually protected, as I said before, by glass, but before the, you put, a, put down a cover glass, you usually grow a silicon nitride layer on top of the silicon. This is what's called typically referred to as a passivation layer, but it also acts as a protective layer. And this silicon nitride layer is what's usually used in most practical solar cells as an anti-reflection layer. Okay, so the glass is a separate thing which comes on top. Let's ignore that for the time being. This is just the bare silicon coming out of the factory. You put down a silicon nitride layer, which is directly grown on top of silicon or deposited on top of silicon. And this layer is designed almost all, always to act like an anti-reflection layer relative to the silicon solar cell. Okay, so the problem we have is the following. What is the thickness of an anti-reflection coating of silicon nitride to reduce reflections from a silicon surface at normal lenses? And the next question is, what, what, what is this thickness at 45 degrees Celsius? Okay, so let's take about, you know, about a minute or so. I want you to draw this diagram and figure out what the thickness would be. It's, of course, very similar to what we just did, so it shouldn't be that difficult. So um, go ahead. And then, and feel free to discuss. And I can certainly ask you questions like this in the exam, because these are simple, right? And it's more, much more conceptual. Okay, so um, uh, is everyone uh, okay with this? So, uh, well, if you're not, make sure you're able to do this uh, when you go home and think about this a little bit. So I can certainly ask you the questions like this. So let's go through the solution, which I actually drew here. The normal incidence is pretty simple, right? It's very similar to what we just did. Light comes in straight down. Let's say that's the thickness D and the factor index, let's say, is N prime. It bounces twice, so it's D plus D, but then you have to multiply it by N prime. So 2D times N prime is lambda over 2. Of course, it can be some odd multiple. I just picked the thinnest uh, layer um, because typically you don't want to make it too thick because uh, this material costs money, right? So you want to make it as thin as possible in order to save costs. So, so you, typically that's what you would do. And that will give you your D. 
Of course, this is only true for a given lambda. So we have a lot of assumptions here, right? So we have a lambda that you have to assume, n prime that you have to assume, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now for oblique incidence, of course, the problem is very similar. You just have to come in at an angle. And oops, the uh, the way you solve it looks like that, right? So light comes in. There is a reflection from the top interface. There's another reflection in the bottom interface. And let's say Q is this angle here. And then you want to make sure that this ray interferes distractively with this ray, right? So the way you do it is you make sure you compute the path length, which is from this point, you go down and up and figure out, okay, what is that distance? And this very simple geometry just turns out to be, this is D over cos Q plus D over cos Q. So you get two D over cos Q times N prime equals lambda over two. And then you can figure out D. So Q is 45 degrees. You can plug in the numbers and you get the answer. Okay. But in general, of course, you don't have this luxury of having a single wavelength or single angle. That means in, if you are really trying to design this for, let's say, glasses or solar cells or whatever, you need to actually integrate all, over all possible Qs and all, all possible lambdas, right? And then you try to solve a large optimization problem. So this is how most people uh, deal with that. Okay. So that... Uh, to me, it was uh, the simplest form of an anti-reflection coding. Again, you're simply just trying to make it such that two rays will destructively interfere. And the way you do it, you make sure there's a layer uh, where the optical path length of these two rays, the difference between the optical path length of those two rays is one half of the wavelength of light. Okay, So it's relatively simple to think about. Unfortunately, in reality, that's not very useful, as I said before, because it's very dependent on wavelength, dependent upon um, the angle and so on. A much more useful technique that people use is what's referred to as index matching. Okay, so let's see what it is. Index matching essentially uh, is an idea that comes from recognizing the fact that the reflection loss that comes from an interface comes from the fact that there is a refractive index difference from one material to another material. What does that mean? That means if you look here, the reason we are losing this light here is because this is refractive index one here and this is refractive index n prime, silicon nitride. As light goes from one material into another material, it not only refracts, of course, here, by the way, I made a mistake. I didn't account for refraction. So this should actually be Q prime, right? Where you account for the Snell's law of refraction. I just ignored that, which is, so this is my mistake here, which by the way, you should try to correct if you, if you see a mistake from me. So in other words, this has to account for refraction of light as well. In any case, just coming back to my original point, uh, the, re the reason that you're getting this light reflected off this interface is because there is a mismatch between the refractive indices as you go across this interface. This is one, this is n prime, right? And, and, and the larger this mismatch is, the larger amount of energy that's lost. So one way to try to reduce this reflection loss is to put an index matching material between these two interfaces such that whose index is in between these two. So refractive index of silicon nitride is actually quite high. So if you can somehow put in a material in between air and silicon nitride whose refractive index is in between one and n prime, it will minimize this reflection losses. And this is the idea of index matching. You're trying to match the index between one material and the other material. Okay? And an extreme way to think about how this can be done is as follows, okay? You can use an infinite number of layers or a large number of layers. Let's say it goes from air, which is one, and very smoothly varying to some refractive index n, okay? This can be done theoretically, but of course, uh, the big problem to do this is that there are no materials whose refractive index is close to one. Such materials do not exist. Most materials have relatively high refractive index. So this becomes very challenging in practice, but it theoretically, if you are able to make a multi-layer structure whose refractive index goes from one, which is air, all the way to some refractive index that you want to make, um, let's say N silicon, silicon nitride, whatever, then this would be a perfect anti-reflection coding. 
it doesn't matter what the wavelength is. Of course, the refractive index will change with wavelength, but assuming in this, uh, the, the, this variation is true for all wavelengths, it doesn't matter what the wavelength is. It doesn't matter what the angle is. It doesn't matter if the light is incoherent. It doesn't need to destructively interfere. Okay, because this is like having a smooth adiabatic change in refractive index. Okay. So it has a big advantage. This is, this is an incoherent approach compared to a, the quarter wave. So no interference effects are required. Okay, so it's a very, very uh, powerful idea. Of course, difficult to implement, but very powerful idea. And this is, I would say, most commonly people combine this idea with the uh, quarter wave uh, layer ideas in order to make very, very effective anti-reflection coatings. So, so let's look at a few examples. Um, so I have a question here. Can you think of other ways to achieve the same effect? And this was a, a question for brainstorming. But uh, so you can think about it. But so so let me first. Uh, we won't do a, an actual brainstorm uh, right now. But let me try to explain what I mean by this question. So in this um, configuration here, I'm assuming that we can make layers of different materials. Okay, and these are uniform layers whose refractive index is changing from one to n. The question here is, are there other ways to achieve the same effect? Okay, and that's what I was uh, asking to brainstorm. And it's a difficult problem. So we'll jump to a few examples of how this can be done in other, other ways as well. So in uh, this is say a very famous result from Harvard from a few years ago, I think about five or six years ago, where they took a piece of silicon, okay, which looks like a mirror, as I said before, like a mirror, right? That's a that's a piece of silicon which is used for solar cells. You can see the, the researcher's face there, and turned it into something which looks like that, completely black. And that's this is great. You want this to be completely black because it absorbs all the light that comes in. Nothing is reflected. Okay. And this is called black silicon. And this is conventional polished silicon. And you can see the drastic difference. And this difference is due to the physics related to this idea that you go from one to the refractive index when no light escapes. It's like a black hole, right? All the light goes straight in. So that's why it looks black. And the way they do it is very, very interesting. It looks like this, okay? This is the surface of silicon at the nanoscale. And what they did was they just roughened the surface of silicon such that they form these conical forests. So at the bottom, this is silicon. So this refractive index is the same as silicon. But as you keep going up on an average, so these are very, very small compared to the wavelength of light. So for light, it, you will average over a pretty big area here, okay? On an average, you can see the fraction of silicon to air is increase, is decreasing as you go up. In other words, here is 100% silicon. As you go up a little bit, there's a little bit more of air. As you go up a little bit, there's a little bit more of air, and so on and so forth, until when you come up here, it's all air, right? So now you have a smooth variation from air, which is up here, to silicon, by simply changing the nanoscale geometry. So it's a very, very clever idea. And this can be processed in a, um, in a, in a scalable fashion, a cost effectively, and so on, right? So that's another way to achieve this uh, idea that we just talked about. And this was proposed to, um, let me see if I can, oops. Yeah, so there was an interesting article here. This is from a few years ago. Their idea was they used this to revolutionize the solar industry and they, they, they spun this out of Harvard and so on. But it turned out that it was a little more expensive. The solar needed a little bit cheaper. So now this company, um, I forget, the, Psionics, I think it's called, is trying to make uh, these devices in image sensors for, for cameras and things like that. So uh, this gives you an idea of what different things are possible. And this is another example of the same kind of a technique where these are big pictures of the silicon wafers, two different silicon wafers, which has little nanoscale pillars. Okay, you, say, you see these little pillars? And only difference between them is the, is the lattice of these pillars. So these are hexagonal lattice and they're face, face kind of far apart. But these are square lattice and they're placed close together. And simply by changing the geometry of these pillars, you can make them darker. So this, of course, absorbs more energy than that. Okay, so you see this really interesting concept 
of using micro and nano patterning or texturing on the surface of silicon in order to change the absorption properties of silicon. And this turns out to be extremely important for the success of the um, solar cell industry. And we will have an entire uh, lecture on this uh, about light trapping, but we'll um, talk about this briefly in this lecture as well. So just keep that in mind. Okay, uh, let, at this point I wanna also show you a little bit about this, uh, these links that I had posted. So let's go to that. So there are two, uh, first of all, there are three links that I posted. First, it shows different, uh, some details of the um, anti-reflection coatings of silicon. So this is examples of silicon uh, squares. So these are silicon wafers essentially cut into squares used for solar panels, which are coated with different anti-reflection coating thicknesses. So you can change the color of the material by changing the thicknesses. So the green here and this, these two are, are very thick layers, whereas this blue is a very thin layer. And you can see the color changes actually quite drastically by thickness. And of course, you, the goal here is to get it to be black, right? You want all the light to be absorbed. So you can read about that. This is quite interesting actually. The other link here talks about a very simple model for an anti-refraction coating. So let me just walk you through it briefly and you're welcome to read through it to get some more detail. So this is silicon, this is our anti-refraction coating and you know, exactly like we drew before and this is air. So light comes in, refracts in, some of it's reflected off and the idea is that you wanna adjust the refractive index of this uh, blue layer here and the thickness D1 such that these two uh, waves interfere destructively, right? That's the idea, so that's what's shown here. So if destructive interference, no light will reflect off this. If there's constructive interference, a lot of light will reflect off it, so. And you can model this, the modeling is a little bit involved, but the idea is simply to use what's called Fresnel reflection, which we will come back to, but the simple equation is shown here. The reflectance of an interface is simply the difference in the refractive indices of the interface divided by the sum of the refractive indices of the interface. Very simple. And you square it, you get the actual reflectance in terms of intensity. This is amplitude reflection. And to get the intensity reflection, you square this. Okay? And of course, if you want to do it at an oblique incidence, that's for normal incidence, you get an equation which looks like that for two layers and so on. So you don't need to know the derivation of all this. I just want you to be aware if you, if you ever need to use it, you can come here and look at it. And they have a really nice Java applet here, which plots essentially the reflection from two interfaces. So keep in mind there are two interfaces here. One, there's an interface from air to this material. Okay, that's this, this top layer. And then the second interface is this one here, which goes from this material into silicon. So you have two plots, reflectance from this, reflectance from this, okay? So that's this, these two plots, this red curve and this blue curve. So blue, blue curve is under glass and the red curve is under air. So this is the first interface, that's the second interface. And this is the reflection and this is the wavelength, the so functional wavelength. And here you can change two things. You can change the refractive index of this anti-reflection layer, this blue layer, or you can change its thickness. So those are the two things you can change with design. So you can play with this, right? So you say, let's say you pick a refractive index of glass, let's say 1.5, right? We'll leave it there. So you can see um, glass, this is same as glass. So you can see uh, the reflectance is flat for, um, for under glass because it's same as glass. Um, so in this case, they're assuming this is glass, not, not, not silicon. So skip that. In there. So, and you can change the thickness of the glass, you know. As you change it, you can vary how much energy is reflected off the top interface. So the red curve is the top interface. Of course, you can also change both, right? You want to minimize it, so you're trying to do that. Right, and try to even minimize, move the, so 600 is kind of what people look for, so you bring it there. You can try to match them and to minimize that, right? So this is a way, for instance, for you to design a single layer anti-reflection coating. Now, keep in mind that this is very restrictive, right? You can only get it low for one wavelength. You can't really do it for broadband. So in order to overcome this restriction, one way is to add another layer of an anti-reflection coating, and this is referred to as a double layer anti-reflection coating, which is shown here, okay? It's in this other link that I posted. So you have layer one with refractive index N1, layer two with refractive index N2, and then there's a silicon wafer in this case. 
Again, that's air. And the equations are very similar, but it gets very complicated. So that's an example of the huge equation you have, and it depends on R1, R2, R3, and theta, and so on. Of course, you don't need to memorize any of that. You know, you, I won't ask you anything related to this in terms of calculating all this stuff. This is just purely for your, that you know how to do it, and you know this is available. So again, this is just the same plot. So this is a reflection from the air interface, and this is a reflection from the glass interface. And you can change, of course, now you have four knobs to change, refractor index of layer one, thickness of layer one, refractor index of layer two, thickness of layer two, and you can play around with it, right? Again, the goal is to minimize everything, right? You want to minimize all of them. So you, want, you can just play with this. It's just a Java applet. Of course, here, you, you know, as you get to, get, get to glass, it, this should flatten out as expected, right? And again, you can change it as well. Okay, so these are useful. I would recommend reading through it just so, so you get a better understanding of it. It's, um, you know, of course, you don't need to memorize any of that. And I put links to that on the, on the class website. So just these are here. Okay, the three links here, you can read them. Okay, let's come back to our lecture. Now, the last uh, topic I want to talk about a little bit is a, I would say the most common way of using anti-reflection coatings in, in solar cells. So this is something which is very, uh, in a sense, counterintuitive, but very, very useful. And it's important uh, for you to understand conceptually how this works, okay? The idea is simple. So let's imagine, let's look at this picture for a second. Imagine there's a silicon solar cell, okay? And most silicon solar cells today are actually textured on the top. They are roughened. Just like we saw in the, one of those pictures before, then at the nanoscale, they're roughened on the surface. Okay, and we'll see why, that, why in a little bit. And let's say we fill the top of this with a material like poly, polymethyl methacrylate or PMMA, which is just a plastic. This is plexiglass. It can be anything. Let's just say PMMA, just because it's a very cheap, simple material to use. Its refractive index is 1.5, very similar to glass. Refractive index of silicon is very high, about 3.5, okay? And that's air, N equals 1. So if you look at a ray of light, let's say coming in, a normally incident, so it just comes straight in. There's a little bit of reflection from this interface, comes straight in, the rest of it comes straight in. There's, of course, quite a bit of reflection at this interface, but this interface is no longer flat, right? It has all these little structure in it, which means that some of this light is reflected this way. It does not reflect straight back because of the geometry here. And the rest of it, of course, goes straight into silicon and gets absorbed and creates energy and current and so on. And so it's a good stuff. Now, what's bad is, of course, some of it's reflected, but because it's reflected at an angle, some of it can be totally internally reflected back into PMMA, right? Because this refractive index of this is 1.5, that's air, so it can totally internally reflect it back and it can keep going, or it can go into, into silicon or keep going bouncing around, okay? So that's the fundamental idea. The fundamental idea is that if you texture the surface of silicon, the light gets a chance to essentially what bounce around in here and it gives it more chances for it to be absorbed in silicon and fewer chances to it for it to leave the system. Or at least that was, that's the hypothesis. Of course, we have to prove it, right? That's the idea. Now, in order to prove this, we have to do some simple analysis, okay? So let's try to see how it can be done. So first, let's define a few constants. First, we have T incident, T I N C, okay? This is the transmission efficiency of light from air to PMMA. So it's how much fraction of light passes this interface. So if this is 100%, this is T I N C percent coming through, okay? Let's define eta, which is the absorption factor at the rear surface of the PMMA or on top of the silicon, which includes <laughs> transmission into silicon. So if you look at this interface, you have energy coming in. Some of it's reflected, some of it goes straight in. Whatever goes in is referred to as eta, okay? Which might be absorbed in silicon, absorbed in the interface, whatever. We don't care at this moment. We just say, okay, all of that's eta. Whatever is reflected then is one minus eta. It is a fraction, okay? So the reflected light is simply 
uh, let's say one came in and inside here is T incident because that's the fraction that came in. Then what it passed through here is eta times T incident. And what reflected is one minus that. So T incident times one minus eta. Eta goes through, one minus eta is reflected. So the reflected light is T incident times one minus eta. Okay, now we can do an analysis. So we can calculate the absorption at each reflection event and add these up. Okay, that gives us how much energy is then absorbed in silicon. So again, light comes in. Okay, T incident is here. It's reflected off here. So this is first absorption happens is T incident times eta. Okay, T incident came in, eta gets absorbed in silicon. One minus eta reflects off. Okay, that's, this is one minus eta times T incident. This is total internal reflection, so it's a, it's a you know, it, theoretically it's 100%, but there is a probability associated with this because it might not be within the critical angle. So I won't go through the derivation, it's not so important for us, but we can assign a probability that this light is actually reflected of this interface, and that probability is defined as this number here. Okay, which is not terribly important how it comes from, but imagine it's close to 100%. It's one minus T bar escape divided by two N squared. So in other words, it is inverse, it is directly proportional to N, the refractive index of this material, which is of course we have a make. Okay, so again, one, it's 100% here. This is T incident. T incident times eta is absorbed. T incident times one minus eta is reflected. And then T incident times one minus eta times this factor is reflected again. So it comes down here, okay? Then you have a second absorption, which is simply this whole thing multiplied by eta again, because we know eta is a factor that absorbed. So it's eta multiplied by everything else, which is same as here. And one minus that is reflected. So you can keep going, right? You can keep going forever. It's an infinite series, essentially. And that's exactly what we do. And we can define. For the pth absorption, let's say p times uh, bouncing around, the number becomes, the fraction that's absorbed becomes eta times t incident, which is the first two things. Then all those absorption uh, reflections that have happened, one minus eta raised to p times one minus t bar escape over two n squared, which is that fraction, fraction that's reflected down from the top interface raised to p. So the total absorption is simply a sum of all those absorption factors, right? So eta t incident, that's the first absorption. This is the second absorption plus third absorption and so on and so forth. It's a huge geometric, it's infinitely long, right? Of course, in practice, it's not infinite because at some point this um, converges really, really quickly. So there's, all the light is essentially absorbed and there's nothing to bounce around with, very, very small amount of light to bounce around. So this is a geometric series, you can solve it. Uh, we all know how to do this from high school math, and this is what you get. Eta times T incident times a very simple equation. One minus, one minus eta times this factor in here. Okay, so this is now a very, very useful expression because what it is telling us is that if I had textured silicon and I have incident light coming in, how much of the energy is actually absorbed here after all these bounces have happened? Okay, so that's a very useful number, right? Because that allows me to essentially design these textures carefully. So eta is the absorption that happens at each point. T incident, of course, is the fraction of light that passes from air to PMA. So that's just this part, okay? And uh, T bar escape is just how much is escaping out and two, uh, over two n squared. So that factor is simply saying how much is escaping out here. So of course you, are to, you wanna minimize that. Now let's plug in some numbers with, into this model. So for PMMA, n is 1.5, for silicon is 3.5. So eta, which is our, um, how much energy is, is absorbed, is simply how much is um, not reflected. So you can simply take one minus whatever is not reflected. And, and this is just making a very simple assumption that no light is absorbed within PMMA or in silicon, which is actually not true because light is absorbed in silicon, but it's a, it's a simple assumption. Uh, and this is uh, our Fresnel reflection loss that we just saw. Remember, it's the difference in the refractive indices between those two materials divided by the sum of the refractive indices, then you square it to get the intensity. 
and one minus that gives you how much is absorbed. Okay, this is how much is reflected. One minus that is how much is absorbed. So you plug in the numbers, you get 84%, 0.84. So each pass through the interface of silicon and PMMA, 84% of the light is actually passing into silicon. That's not bad, right? T incident is the fraction of light that passes from air into PMMA. So you can do a very similar calculation, but now between PMMA and air, air is of course one. So you take the difference, you calculate it, you get 96%, okay? So that's good. That's also under uh, what we expect because as I said at the very beginning, our 4% of light is reflected off glass and glass and PMMA have the similar refractive index. So that's, that's good. And we also make, can make some other approximations like T bar escape is the same as T incident. And there are some reasons for this I won't go into. This comes from thermodynamics. Then now you can take this equation and start plug in. So this T and this T are equal, let's say, and eta is uh, 84%. Um, and N, N is the 1.5, okay? So plug, the, plug, plug all that in, you get a number, and that is 92.3%. So what has happened, okay? What has happened is the following. We have, by simply texturing the surface of silicon and placing a layer of uh, plastic on top, or uh, plexiglass on top, we have reduced the, or increased the absorption from 84%, uh, actually, not even 84% because we actually have to do the calculation for, for PMMA, which will be much higher, to 92%. Um, in other words, let me, let me rephrase what I'm saying. If you don't do anything, silicon, a large fraction of energy is reflected much lower. So this number will be much lower than 84. It will be like 60, 70%. By simply texturing the silicon and putting a PMMA layer on top, you have increased that to 92%. So that, that's a very significant increase, especially if you're talking about solar cells, which operate all year for 25 years, right? Because all of this accumulate. So even a few percent can make a huge difference in the cost of ownership of a solar panel. So that's why this is a very, very practical and very important way to improve the performance of solar cells. So that's what summarized here. So what we just found is by texturing the silicon surface and putting PMMA on top, 90% of the light gets absorbed in silicon and the PMMA silicon interface. So only about 10% of the light is reflected back. So PMMA on top of randomly textured silicon acts as a very, very good ARC, anti reflection coating. Now in comparison, if no PMMA or texturing was present, the reflectivity of a polished silicon wafer would be very, very high. You know, you can, this is what I was saying. This is the difference between silicon and air square it, you get 31%. So in other words, if you don't do anything, you get lose 31% of the light, okay? But by doing this, you only lose about 10% of the light or less, right? So that's a pretty significant decrease. You go over, over three and a half times smaller. So that's why it's important to be able to make these center reflection points. Okay. Now let's look at this example of a simple index matching again, uh, where we are just looking at um, uh, index matching with no texturing. So in order to understand the impact of texturing. Okay? So let's take the case of silicon, N is 3.5, and ARC, uh, let's say some thickness of N, and this is air, N equals one. What is the total loss by reflection of the ARC? Okay, we'll try to calculate this. Of course, we know how to do this because all we need to do is we need to compute how much is reflected of this interface, how much is reflected of inter this interface and add them up. Okay, that will be the simplest way to do it. Of course, there are some assumptions here. We're going to assume we are going to ignore multiple reflections in between in that particular case. Okay, And that's a reasonable assumption because there's no texturing here, this is flat. So there'll be less light going at some funny angles, right? So the reflection from the top interface is easy, it's one, you compare the one and this n, right? And the second interface is also easy to compare this n to 3.5. And that's done here. So first of all, we assume that the refractive index of the ARC is in between. So we just take the average in between, one plus 3.5 over two, 2.25. 
So reflection one from the top interface is simply the difference between 2.25 and AR squared divided by the sum. So you get 15% is reflected at the top. And do the same thing for the bottom, you get 7.4% reflected at the bottom. Total reflection is just add them up. And this is approximate. Like I said, you're ignoring the multiple reflection, but this is approximate. You get about 22% of the lights reflected. So what this is saying in comparison, keep in mind that if you don't do anything, right? If you just use silicon, it's 31% of the lights reflected. Now here, by simply putting in an anti-reflection coating whose refractive index is 2.25, you reduce that to 22%. So that's pretty good. But by simply texturing and putting those cheap polymethyl methacrylate layer on top, you can reduce this even further to 10% or less. So that's why the texturing is very, very powerful. Okay, so you can appreciate that. So that's summarized here. So just to summarize, this is the key take home message of this lecture. And we'll stop here because this is my last slide. The PMMA and texturing proves to be a very effective anti-reflection coating due to the effective light trapping because of those multiple reflections. So the reflectivity can be as low as 10% or smaller, okay? Compare that to if you don't do anything, the reflectivity is over 30%. And even if you just use an ARC, the reflectivity can be best about 22%. So by texturing and using an anti-reflection coating, you can get it much lower, about 10%, which is good. Note that all solar cells are of course encapsulated in glass for protection from the elements. So there is always a reflectivity of about 4% of the top because of the glass. Uh, so reducing this uh, to 11% is pretty good since 4% is the best one can hope to achieve. Now, of course, that's not a strictly true statement because you can also put an anti-reflection coating on the glass as well. In this example, of course, we talked about putting an anti-reflection coating on silicon. You can also imagine putting something on top of the glass as well, right? As we talked about in, earlier in the lecture. So you can do both in order to win. Uh, but of course, the challenge is you want to do this in a cost-effective fashion for solar cells. Uh, now, uh, they cost uh, sensitive. Okay, so we'll stop here. That's my last slide. And um, I will uh, let you uh, use the remaining time to discuss with the team about your assignment. So just keep in mind that we have the review on Thursday, this Thursday. Next week is fall break. And the following Tuesday, there is no class. So use that time to prepare for your midterm. And also make sure the assignment three is due on that day as well. Okay. And the midterm is in class on Thursday, October 19th. Okay. Well, uh, are there any questions before we stop?